back to the Board Drill Podcast. My name is Kyle. As always with us is our co-host, Matt Dixon. And we have a special guest tonight. It's Coach Tony Holler. He is a track coach at Plainfield North and the creator of Feed the Cats. We were just talking with him. He's coached for over 43 years. And he just told an interesting story before he got on. I'll let him talk a little more about it. But he was just invited to France to work with the Soccer Federation. So it just goes to show you that track is is something that can transfer to a lot of other sports but tonight we're going to talk about how it can transfer to football so coach welcome to the show we're happy to have you on i'm excited thank you absolutely matt we got to do our typical cheer here we go hey coach there we go (laughs) all right so coach the very first question we're going to ask you a lot of people are listening and a lot of coaches that i've talked to know what feed the cats is but a lot don't so just starting off what is feed the cats um Instead of going through the history of it, cats are athletes, in my opinion. Uh, sometimes I, I used to say they're fast twitch athletes. Uh, the, they're those they're those elastic, fast um, athletes that can dunk and sprint and all those things. <clears throat> but but I, I think that my message is sometimes lost because people tell me, "Well, we just have dogs on our team. We don't have any cats," <laughs> and and so they they. They act like, well, we can't learn anything from this guy because he's talking about these yeah. fast guys, and we're not fast guys. But I, I think we need to we need to transform dogs into cats, so to speak. We oh, yeah. need to get kids more athletic, and I'm talking about all kids, not just the skinny greyhounds. But we need to get the <laughs> big cats uh, on board as well. And then it just when I heard somebody say 25 years ago that sprinters were like cats. They weren't yeah. like distance runners. Uh, and, and I was like, yeah, you know, I, I, I want to feed the cats, you know, like, and I love the word feed because uh, it's, it's like nourish, yeah. uh, serve. I, 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 I want to be that kind of a coach that, that, that will feed my kids. And now, you know, it doesn't mean I'm soft on them, but, <laughs> but I want to do everything I can do to make them better athletes. And it, it really makes sense. And in practice, it even works better than I thought it would. Absolutely, coach. So, uh, you know, getting to it, it, you know, I know a lot about it and and all this stuff. So you briefly talked about what it is. How did you even come up with this idea? Like, where did it come from? Well, it came from, uh, I went to a clinic and, you know, 10 years from now, we're going to be the exact same people we are now, except for the books we read and the people we meet. And so, I, uh, I I met a guy. Uh, he was just a, a nobody track coach from out east. Um, actually, he was pretty special, but I'd never heard of him. And and he talked about cats, and he talked about how we shouldn't run the cat out of athletes. Yeah, you know, we and, and I think you know I thought back to myself. Uh, my my training in football, basketball, and track was miserable. I, I yeah. hated practice. Practice was the crap that we had to go through to play in the games. <laughs> and my football coach used to say, we're going to break you down and build you back stronger. And and all that's BS. It's, it's all crazy. You are disregarding the health of athletes. You're making them slower. And, of course, they didn't know they were making them slower because nobody ever timed anything in practice, anything. So it, it, it started off with just the idea that that some athletes are cats and the other thing was, and, and to be a track coach, your number one job is to get athletes to want to be in your sport. Oh, yeah. I say that every school has a good track team. They're just not running track. <laughs> They're walking the hallways. And what's crazy about football these days is that football used to get all the athletes they wanted, and they don't anymore. There are football programs out there that don't get a single basketball player to come out for the team because of the BS they do in the summer and, and the military military type of training and blah, blah, blah. And, and so the whole idea that we could make practice the best part of a kid's day. Yeah. Let the games be hard. Oh, that just blows coaches minds. Uh, My dad, 47 years of coaching high school and college basketball. You say, we're going to make practice so hard that the games are easy. And we all thought that that made sense. And so that's what we all did. And I, I tell people that every coach, even the dumb ones, know that you got to take the day after a game off. 
but what if practices are harder than games? And, and we're just stacking practice on top of practice on top of <laughs> practice. And what, we don't care about recovery? We don't care about dampening the outputs, the speed and strength. And, and, and then you throw in the fact, one of the biggest things about Feed the Cats in the football sense is, is that um, Feed the Cats football coaches basically report near 100% health of their roster when they play in the state championship. I believe we had six state champions this past wow. year that fed the cats and all of them reported that not only were they healthy, but all 50, whatever guys played in the championship game because they won by three touchdowns and, you know, <laughs> Tom made them, and, and these guys were all healthy. And what I've, I don't know really why, but I know that when you sprint, for some reason, you become healthier. Um, when you care about your team speed, you care about health. You 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 can't just say rub dirt on it, and the guy's not <laughs> going to be fast if you just grind them. Um, but but there's just a, a whole. I, I think there has to be something to do with a permanent state of fatigue that causes injuries. And looking back as an athlete myself, I was in a permanent state of fatigue all through my high school life. Yeah, coach. You know, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, when we moved to it uh, in our football program, we saw that our soft tissue injuries went way down, just like you're saying, right? Like we still had guys that broke bones and tore ligaments and, and that's not really right, but we're talking about soft tissue, the, Hey, I pulled a hamstring. I did this. So that was a big thing. Uh, before we get into that though, I want to back it up just a little bit. When we're talking about timing was a big thing that you brought up and I know is a big piece of it. So couple of questions for you. A, how do people normally time? And I think I know the answer to that. Um, but then the secondary question I'm going to ask you is if you don't have the ability to buy that, if, if do that, let's say we're in a super low income school, what's the answer to timing and how do we handle that? As coaches, especially as track coaches. Um, but, but I think all coaches have to resort to the next best thing all the time. I mean, absolutely. We, 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 we our situation is never perfect. Coaches are the ultimate problem solvers. Um, they're constantly looking for solutions. So what I would say timing wise, and there are all the feed the cat schools basically have, have replaced their stupid warm up 40 minutes of <laughs> 40 minutes of seeking fatigue, you know, stations and all that crap and, and replaced it with what I call my atomic speed workout which people can find it's free on, on YouTube. And, uh, and basically you can do a, a 20 minute workout where you get two time sprints in. And I believe that free lap is the best thing you can buy. It's going to cost a football coach. If, if you really get, you know, the best you can get, it's going to cost you about four, 4,000. Um, but the uh, it, it's, it's weatherproof. Um, it's, it, it comes in a, a, I mean, it could easily fit in a backpack. I mean, it's, it's, it's light. Yeah. It's a free lap is absolutely amazing and a game changer. And if you did not have that for the first 10 years of feed the cats, I use a stopwatch. That's it. Now the, uh, you can't do flies. Uh, a fly is a, where you get to top speed and then you time somebody. Yeah. You can't do flies, but, but you can do 40 yard dashes. And I love flies because you can quickly change a fly time into miles per hour. And I think miles per hour is just the greatest thing in the world for speed training. You know, how fast can your car run is so fundamentally important to athleticism that I love it, love it, love it. But if you don't have it, what I would do like before practice, there'd be four lines and, and you'd have four coaches that you'd trust. Uh, that might be hard to do, you know, to have four, four football coaches that are trustable with a stopwatch. Um, I can only picture that. Um, so anyway, you would have four lines and you would time, each guy would run two forties and, yeah. and you would yell out the time, not just to the kid, but also to the group, because that's how you feed the cats. You, you stoke that competitive nature and, and then you'd have somebody with a clipboard writing down the times. And when you go home, you entered the times and you, then you would like, you know, like figure out like, were we fast today? Were we slow today? <laughs> uh, why were we so slow today? Oh, maybe it was yesterday's practice, you yeah. know, like, and then that's maybe why feed the cat schools are so much more healthy. But yeah, if you do time 
with a stopwatch. I would probably average the best two times just so that, you know, that you don't have a, a crazy time once in a while. But I, I would do that. Somebody even said, could we just race? And I, I would say that would be the next best thing. You yeah. know, just just have two two by two races where guys are going top speed and having a great time. The bad thing about that is that you just don't have any data. Yeah. I think you're coaching in the dark. Um, and that's, if, if you don't have data, you don't know where you've been. You don't know where you're going. You say that looks pretty good, but you don't know. And, and, and I, I just think you're missing out on that huge motivational thing for kids where you make speed um, something that they, let's just say that every one of my kids, we do about eight different speed things, different metrics. Yeah. Every one of my kids know exactly what their PR is in all eight. That's they awesome. Care. They care. Yeah, coach. And, and before we get into the football piece of it, I the other part I really like was kind of like your reward system. And I know that's evolved, but it's something we did. Um, you know, we did those wristbands, right? Everyone knows those rubber wristbands that started with the Lance Armstrong thing. And you can get those printed up. And, and we did exactly what you say. We printed up per mile per hour. Mm -hmm. And you'd be shocked. I would do exactly what you do. I was, I, I do graphic design as well. So I would post a really cool graphic of our kids times and they would be on the front porch of my portable the next morning at seven ten in the morning, coach, where's my 21 mile an hour wristband. And I loved every bit of it, but it was wild. I mean, coach, there was a, a, a line every single day, coach. I hit this thing. I need my wristband coach. I hit that. And they wore it around school and there were other kids that were jealous of it. That one that came out to track because of it. And I was like, that's when I really knew that we had something there. Uh, not only did it work in football, when I went to track, I was like, I have 80 kids that are trying to sprint right now. <laughs> We've love. never, I mean, we had a concrete track coach. We were not a big school as far as that. We were good, but a lot of kids, like you said, they were basketball players, football players. I don't want to run track coach. Then all of a sudden they were all out at track practice. And I was like, all right, I'm doing something right. I'm not, I'm not the best, but I'm doing something right. So Matt, let's go ahead and transition into football and, and ask uh, yeah. some of those questions. Coach, I mean, I've never <laughs> coached a day of track in my life. I've been an <laughs> offensive line coach, an offensive guy for the most part, a uh, football guy. Uh, so, so looking at some <clears> – <throat> just listening to some of the things you say sounds just – I mean, I'm sure a lot of coaches are out there saying this is completely opposite than what we were taught to do as coaches and what we were shown to do. So there's a lot of – I'm sure there's a lot of coaches out there that need to hear this. Um, and, and looking at the football aspect of it, we really get in Florida eight weeks, eight weeks to prep for the season in the summer, Florida heat. Um, so, so what's a way we could take this and kind of apply it to football? I understand the timing of it and getting better there, but, but really a full application to football. What would that kind of look like in that eight weeks? In that eight weeks, one of the great things about a sprint based program instead of a, a grind program is that, it's the perfect thing to do in a hot Florida summer because the atomic speed workout, I say it's 15 minutes, but it'd probably take 20 minutes. If you have a pretty big group, it's 20 minutes, but it's about 60 seconds of work. You don't get heat stroke with 60 seconds of work. It's not like sending people off on, you know, like run four laps. Yeah. You know, that, that, that's the crap that people die from. Um, but so what I always suggest off season wise, and by the way, eight weeks is enough to improve every single guy on your team by over one mile an hour. And that doesn't sound like much, but one mile an hour improvement, that human is a different human. I mean, that athlete is a different athlete. Uh, if you remember the boot, uh, the, when uh, DK Metcalf ran down Buda Baker. Yep. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Everybody mm -hmm. remembers that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> It looked like Metcalf was running 100 miles an hour faster than Baker. He was running 1.3 miles per hour faster. That's what like one mile an hour looks like. So what I suggest is that you have three different segments of your work in the summer. And that is speed, strength, and on the field work. Now, I believe the on the field work needs to be brief. Uh, we're, we're talking about you know, about 45 minutes for each thing. And, you know, a football coach would be like, oh, no, we can't get everything in if we're only working 45 minutes on the field. And what I say is you're doing too much. <laughs> you, you know, simplify. 
get, you know, find the 20% of your work that gives you 80% of the results and focus on that 20, expand that 20. And I'm telling you, the, the, as soon as you commit to this, less is more, performance is more important than hard work, that winning is more important hmm. than high effort. If you commit to these ideas, what happens is that you, you will start to simplify and and you will find that you can do a lot less. And as soon as you start cutting stuff out, it automatically gets better. It, I'm like, I'm a writer. And, and as much as it hurts to cut stuff out of my, the things I write, I always make my stuff better when I do it. It's always better. You don't cut out the good stuff. Yeah. Uh, coach, I, I asked a coach one time, how many pass plays you got? He goes, about 20. I, I said, well, cut it down to 10. And you could tell it hurt him. You know, it hurt him. <laughs> and, and I said, what 10 would you cut out? He goes, probably the ones that aren't as effective as that's the idea. So, so you go speed, strength, football. And I, that, that's kind of an oversimplification. But, but I believe that if you do that, and really stay consistent. Uh, that that what's going to happen is is that all of your guys are going to get faster, healthier, more athletic. And people always wonder, like, well, but they're not going to be in shape for for August workouts or August practice. I mean, well, you're practicing too much then. <laughs> don't do as much in August. Don't don't have a four hour practice. Well, but so yes, everything I talk about is counterintuitive, but it's right. Um, and, and it's, it drives coaches nuts because, you know, there are coaches like me that have coached for a long time and they, they realize they've been wrong their whole life. And that's not easy. That's no. but my favorite people to talk to are those veteran coaches that buy into my stuff because they are like reborn. Um, yeah. they are like new people. They're like, Oh my God, I wish I could go back in time, but I can't. But I'm so happy. I'm so happy I have it now. And being an offensive lineman, the the absolute one of my I just preach that every offensive lineman need to speed train. I don't I don't care if you think you're slow or not. We need to turn those 16 mile an hour guys into 17 mile an hour guys. And one of the great things in a feed the cats program is we reward big guys that can sprint with something called the truck stick. Are you guys aware of that? I have not heard this one. No. Okay. All right. Bear with me. The truck stick is nothing more than the physics momentum uh, times mass. So what we do is you, you change, you, you, we weigh every kid and we change pounds to kilograms because that's like sciencey. Yeah. And, and then, and then we do a miles per hour. You know, do, do the flies. We change miles per hour. Simple transition. I have a spreadsheet I can send you if you want it. That has all the calculations already done for you. And and so we change miles per hour into meters per second. And so we get we get something that, like Garrett Mueller, who feeds the cats, state champ, 14-0 and 0 in uh, Minnesota. He gives the wristbands for speed and dog tags for truck stick. 600, 700, 800. He's hmm. never had an 800 that was not all conference. It is, if you think about it, if you have a big guy that's fast, he's almost always going to be a good football player. Yeah, almost always explosive. Always. It is, it, it's the holy grail. It, I love to tell the story that, okay, every time you have an NFL combine, every single offensive tackle is around 6'5", 315. Every single one up. The ones that run four eight and four nine, they're drafted in the first round. The ones that run five three or five four, go undrafted. And people can say, "Oh, that that's not fair because they never run a forty in games." This is a multi billion dollar industry. They know that fast big guys do not fatigue in the fourth quarter. They know that fast big guys may last until they're 40 years old whereas slow big guys fatigue early and and they don't age well and so the idea that 
a high school, I hate to say it, but like mine, that has these 6'4", 270-pound kids that never, ever, ever speed train drives me crazy. We are allowing these big guys to be non-athletic. I guarantee you those guys that run 4'9 in the 40, uh, those guys that are 315 and run 4'9, their first step is faster than slow guys' first steps. They they pack a punch better than slow guys. So it all starts to work out. And by the way, first round offensive tackles typically have a truck stick of nearly 1,400. Wow. Because they can run 20 Whoa. miles an hour. Yeah. And they weigh 315. So, so the idea that we are rewarding, yes, fast guys, but also fast big guys, and you're keeping this data, and you have some freshman that comes in at 600, and he graduates at 900, he's a D1 player. Yeah. So I, I just love <laughs> the idea that we're, we're going to train big guys like athletes. I hate it when they're called hogs. You know, I, I just hate it. I, I've had head football coaches that have told me that you got to be mean to big guys. You got to drive them. You got to cuss them. And I'm like, you know, I, I don't even know who you no. are. You know, I'm like, <laughs> what kind of a monster are you? So, uh, so no, I, I'm a really big on training the bigs like big cats and not hogs. So but before you ask the next one, Matt, I, d I did a quick, I have this old sheet when I worked at Florida State in recruiting, and we averaged combine. Um, it was combine measurement, 40-yard averages from 2014, 2016. So it's a little dated. But, man, Coach, how close you were to the actual average combine. The tackles averaged 6'6", 316.7 pounds. And the average 40 time, now this is first all the way through the sixth round, was 5.08. And so it, everything that you just said, I was able to like look up really quickly. I was like, oh, I'll pull up the sheet and just see how, man, that was dead on coach. So. Have you, Kyle, have you ever um, seen a 40 time of a typical offensive tackle at the high school level? Uh, Matt, you would know this better than me. It's usually like five, seven, five, uh, eight, yeah. six, yeah. six, one. And these guys, these guys aren't 315. They may only be 250, but they can't run. And yeah. but yet they, they do all this lifting and all this conditioning and they just uh, drives me crazy. <laughs> That's yeah. On point coach. <clears throat> um, next, I mean, all right. So we're leading. That's the summer leading it into the season. What could co football coaches do to kind of integrate it into the season? I know we do some in season conditioning. I was never one to condition in season. I always wanted the practices to be our conditioning. So if we're making the practices easier, what are we doing for are they to integrate this into the season? Um, it, it sounds like I call it drinking the Kool-Aid because it sounds like, you know, like you got to be crazy to do this. <laughs> but but um, a Feed the Cats team does no conditioning. Now, S&C people say, well, everything you do is conditioning. I'm like, well, that's not the way I grew up. Conditioning was that crap you did at the end of practice where yeah. you're trying to get tired. I mean, like they're just running you to your dead. And then you had to push through the barriers and oh, we're tough and everything. And, uh, and so basically you eliminate that you play fast, you perform in practice, crazy concept because practice was never performance level. It was always slow and draggy and all that. Well, so you perform in practice, you stop conditioning, you give the kids the weekends off. Oh, blasphemy. You know, like, what? You can't do that. You know, you, you can't. You, no, you got to bring them in on Saturday mornings. Uh, Feed the Cats schools do not do that. Um, and, of course, the coaches become healthier by doing that. They have healthier home lives. There are no coaches that talk more about family and God than football coaches. It's probably because they're so bad at home with their family <laughs> and the fact they don't go to church on Sunday because they're wrapped. So anyway, it frees you to be like a functional human being uh, as you do less. So the way a Feed the Cats program would be, would, would be you would have two performance level practices during the week and two fundamental practices. No conditioning. You would do two speed workouts during the week, probably as your warm up on a performance level day. Um, performance level does not mean hard. 
It just means that we're really going fast. And there will be more walking than you, you like in practice. Um, but that that recovery is so important for guys to go at game speeds. As a coach, I just cannot accept never getting to game speed during the week. And, you know, a lot of football coaches are huge on yelling for effort. Yeah. But effort is all you have when you're too fatigued to perform. And so what I would yell for is speed. I would yell performance. And if I saw guys huffing and puffing, um, a receiver or some, I'd substitute somebody in for him that would run a, a good route. I mean, in track, we would never practice the hurdles tired. God forbid we would never practice the pole vault tired. We might kill ourselves. But it's performing. And and we just have to get out of the mindset of, you know, this is the way Bear Bryant did it. This is the way my <laughs> coach did it. And this is the way I'm going to do it. And if you don't like that, hit the highway. And then start bitching that none of your basketball players are playing football. <laughs> Yeah, coach, that makes a lot of sense. We, um, the program I was a part of a lot, they, they were hurry up team on offense. And as we adopted this, uh, coach would, you'd see him, they were boy, when they ran, they ran. And in between drills, he would literally look at his guys. He's like, you better not run. Don't jog, just walk. And so, and it was amazing. Cause when we tuned up those periods, like we said, when they went fast coach, no one went faster than these guys we were so prepped on defense for a no huddle team from another team. Cause our team went so fast that it never bothered us. But I was shocked, you know, my very first year when I was learning this stuff, how much they walked during practice. I was like, well, these guys are walking. Like, what are they going to look like in the fourth quarter? Uh, we were super fast in fourth quarter coach. We blew by people. Yes. Our offense yeah. averaged 42 a game. So they, they knew what they were doing. <laughs> Being healthy and fast is the best way to perform at a high level in the fourth quarter. And there are so many people that ask me the question, what about two-way players? Don't they need twice the conditioning? And the other thing is if we're a hurry-up team, don't we need twice the conditioning? And I say, no, you need half the conditioning. Or <laughs> you, Those two-way players, you can't lose those guys. Yeah, They have to come in with their batteries like at 100% on game night, not at 60%. So, no, you've got to really take care of those people. And, you know, this, the whole importance of hurry up, the, the secret sauce of hurry up, as you know, is, is to wear out the defense yep. while you are cutting corners on offense, <laughs> while, while, while you, you are subbing wide receivers, while the offside wide receiver is not running a route. He's just standing there like Randy Moss. While the other guy runs, and then you want to run the defense from one side of the field to the other, to uh, while you while your linemen don't don't hustle, don't hustle. Yep. Recover, recover. We want the other team to run to the ball. We don't want to do that. And by doing that, you stay much fresher than your opponent. And yeah, I just I I just don't think you have to condition more in order to get that done. Yeah, coach. Funny enough that you said that. One of the um. It's uh, who's the guy at USF now? Is it Grinch or whatever his name is? Golish. Golish, sorry. Um, you know, Alex Golish, my buddy was listening to him, and they said something like that. They said one of the weird things they identify is who's the hustle guy on defense? Like, who's that one dude that sprints the ball every time, no matter what? And he said, We knew we couldn't always beat him deep, but if we made him chase the ball across the field a couple times, then we put a fresh wide receiver in and then beat him deep. And they, they talked about that. And I, that was my, oh crap moment as a defensive guy. I was like, oh Lord. And, um, because on defense, you have to run the ball. Cause you never know when a, a tackle is going to get broke. And that guy's the last guy. So I was like, man, that's really smart of the offense to identify who the guy is that's definitely going to hustle on every play, get him super tired, then throw a deep ball on him. So I was like, oh man, what are we going to do about that? But that, that sounds like the most feed the cats thing kind of side note ever of, uh, just tiring that guy out while letting someone walk in front of him. So that's right. Matt, you got the next one? Um, yeah, Coach. Uh, I'm going to kind of change it up here, though, because I, I think I'm getting my answers <laughs> I like to hear. Um, but you said – I want to go back to something that he said, uh, the, the CNS training. And I, I think it was 2017 to 2018, Kyle, at Oviedo High School, where 
we started to try to put CNS training for reactionary and agility trills, and we saw massive results for it. Coach, can you talk a little bit about CNS training, what it means to you, and, and how it can be applied to those football situations? It, it's interesting. I'm actually um, – um, in. I talk often with probably the uh, the poster child of CNS training, a guy named Adam Archuleta. Um, I'm actually doing a podcast with him uh, and then sometime in the next couple of weeks, but he was always a hero of mine. But CNS training is first of all sprint training. I say that sprinting is more electrical than it is muscular. Yeah. And that hurts a lot of feelings. <laughs> but but uh, the ability to move your arms and legs fast has very little to do with how strong you are. Um, it has a lot to do with, with raising the ceiling of what the brain allows body, the body to do. So I, I say that the most extreme movement in the world is sprinting with spikes on getting timed in a straight line. That is, that's the, that's, guys are running about 10 meters a second. Now, a CNS lift would be moving the bar about two miles an hour. I mean, basically, <laughs> CNS stuff is fast, snappy. CNS stuff has to be done with a fresh brain, a fresh CNS. If you are fatigued, you can't train speed. You cannot train. You cannot train the CNS if you're jet lagged. If you're uh, tired from a workout the day, I don't know if you've ever been terribly jet lagged, but you're not very good at anything. I mean, you're not good at thinking. You're not very good at reacting. You're you're not. You, if you got timed in a forty, it'd be like the slowest time you've ever run. <laughs> so, so sprinting uh, to me is is the key thing. And then I think there's other things too, and I call them my X factor drills. And that is the elastic, bouncy, jump type things. And we do these things for about five seconds, and then we move on. I'm not sure if you've seen the way McCaffrey trains. Um, I, I have a lot of stuff on my YouTube about it because Brian Kula is a very good friend of mine and he trains McCaffrey has done so since McCaffrey was like 12. And if you look at the stuff McCaffrey does, everything is bouncy, snappy, fast. And it's about five seconds because anything more than five seconds, you're working on something other than speed. I mean, you might be getting work done, but it's not speed work. And, and so when I, you know, first talked to Brian Kula, I was very interested. I said, now, what I see, is that all you do? Or are you doing some conditioning, you know, at the end of the week? And he goes, no, that's all we do. We we lift, we bounce, we 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 uh, do plyos, we sprint. Uh, but no, we, we don't do any type of conditioning. I said, now, does McCaffrey, this is when he was with the Panthers, does, does McCaffrey have trouble, like, with their conditioning test on the first day? And he goes, Oh, they did, you know, like 16 one tens, but he won it. <laughs> and it's like, <clears throat> so Brian, do you think that we can get, you know, like old school in shape without doing old school things? He said a hundred percent. Basically really good athletes. They're in shape. Yeah. Really good athletes do not experience the fatigue that slow non-athletic kids experience. And so that's why I think we need to look, look at getting everybody faster, bouncier. I call it, we want to turn everybody into an apex predator. Love that. We, football has to love that. Yeah. How do we not love that term, right? Matt, be an apex predator out on the field. Got to have it. You know, coach, you talk about this and we talked about being in shape and condition. And we always noticed that. Even even the first year we did Feed the Cats, we were super, you know, game one, we're always like, man, we don't feel like we're in shape. We don't feel like doing this. And I'm talking about doing Feed the Cats like just in the summer. And me and a, and a coworker came up with, you know, kind of a, a hypothesis. And we said, well, this is how we sprint. We do this all summer. But then we get into fall and we basically practice for 17 straight days going into our first game. And you know how it is. You practice hard and you get after it. And I was sitting there thinking, I was like, are we out of shape or are we just tired? Are we tired after 17 straight days of practice? And yeah. then listening to more of your stuff, I was like, maybe that's it. And the next year we cut down on it and we said, okay, like we're going to practice those days. But some of those days, the practice is going to be super light, a lot of film, some walkthrough, maybe some slight jog and some drills and more like mental. 
And sure enough, we came out that next year. Boy, we look sharp in game one. We look like the other team. Like it looks like they were running with sand, you know, in sand. It looked like we were running on, on turf. It was unreal. So that's one thing that you're talking about that, like, I can remember this, you know, is clean, you know, as clear as day how this happened with us. Yeah, I would like to in- interject <laughs> three things that popped in my head just now. Um, one is that I think that many football programs condition all summer to prepare for the conditioning in those 17 days. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like we're conditioning <laughs> for the conditioning. Uh, I asked a college track coach, how come you're running your sprinters like 15, 200s? He goes, we have to develop the capacity for two hour practices in the spring. I go, why do you need a two hour track practice to prepare for a race that, that takes 22 seconds, <laughs> I mean, like, but, but yet we have this stuff in our, our mind. And then the second thing, a guy named Eric Corum, who is a good friend of mine, yeah, he was, uh, he was the science guy for the Houston Texans. They use it in Kentucky, but anyway, brilliant guy. And, uh, he, he, I have a slide with his quote that says we should be uncomfortable with how little we do in the first week. And I love the word uncomfortable because if you have 90 minute practices the first week, Oh, we all grew up old school. We are going to be uncomfortable, Hmm. but yet, but yet it, if we stack fatigue on fatigue on fatigue, we just practice slow. And then the third thing, this is really important. What game is it where kids have all the cramps? Oh, it's it's usually game one, right? Week one. That's when you're thinking of it. Week one. And, <laughs> and you know, I, I remember Willie Taggart at Florida State. He's a total idiot. Uh, his, his agent <laughs> must be really good. I'm sorry. Were you guys friends of his? No, oh, I, I, no. I'm a huge Florida State guy. I worked at Florida State before Willie, and I was so upset when they hired him. I can now say this out loud, but – Good. It's a, it's a, it's definitely a, the dark times for us when, when he yeah. was there, it was a tough deal. Now his agent, his agent <laughs> must be spectacular because Willie keeps getting <laughs> jobs everywhere. Yeah, he works for like the Ravens now or something. Oh, pro- oh. anyway, he had like, <laughs> he lost, he was a big favorite in an opening game and lost and they had like a thousand cramps and stuff. And he threw his team under the bus. Like, oh, they didn't hydrate, no pickle juice, blah, blah, blah. blah. And here's the deal. We cramp because of a hyperactive nervous reflex arc, which basically means we're not used to game speed. Yeah. We're not, we're playing at game speed for the first time. You know, I think, I think in Tallahassee it's pretty hot in August. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) It's very hot. They're probably practicing three hours a night. Yeah. It's not that they're not in that kind of shape. The problem is, They've been practicing at 60 miles an hour through permanent fatigue, and then they play 80 in a game. What I say is practice less, practice at 100 miles an hour. You will not have a single cramp, not a single cramp. And it's not the heat. It's not the hydration. Oh, go ahead and, you know, hydrate and everything. But no matter what the team is, they will probably not have as many cramps the rest of the season as they do in that first game. And that's because they're starting to get in game shape. Yeah, absolutely. Coach Holler, Coach Holler I have a question about that. Um, I've seen it a few times at a few different schools where the top athlete or top athletes, when they get to game situations, they cramp. Is that because they're going 80% in practice because they are the top athlete? I mean, is that what it I could, could kind of assume from what you said? It, it, it could be. I mean, obviously, there's different reasons why you are practicing slow. I think the major reason for practicing slow is that is that you no, know, I hate to say it because I mean I was a pretty good athlete, but I would coast early in practice, saving it up for you know the last half, and then I was tired in, this, in the last half. You yeah. know, so so I was slow the entire practice <laughs> yeah i mean this is some you know like in back in the 70s when i played quarterback we actually had different shoes for games in practice i don't know if people still do that our our practice shoes were like these rubber molded uh high tops you know to protect our ankles they were meant to be slow 
And and then we would put on our expensive shoes for games. <laughs> but that was kind of the mindset is that, yeah, practice is just slow and miserable. And I'm here saying, if you would make football practice like the best part of a kid's day, you might be surprised. For yeah. one thing, for one thing, you wouldn't have to be such a son of a bitch, you know, the whole practice as a coach. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and like maybe you wouldn't go home and kick your dog and yell at your wife. You know, oh, I mean Matt, I feel like he's talking right to me, Matt, like when I was coaching I about know. five years ago. Oh, I think he's talking right certain to my me. heart. <laughs> I mean, it's it's hard to be a football coach. You know, yeah. it really <laughs> is because you have a tired clientele that doesn't want to be there for your miserable praxis. And so and all that stuff, you know, getting kids to look forward to practice where, where kids come kind of bouncy. Yeah. You will start oh. reflecting that as, as, as a football coach. And I think oh, you're talking about those 17 practices before the first game. This sounds crazy, but just imagine if, if guys practice Monday and Tuesday and took one Wednesday off. Yeah. Monday and Tuesday would be better, better practice. Thursday oh. would be better. I know that's once again, it hmm. almost like there's a religious element in football, as you well know. Yeah. It's patriotic. It's religious. It's traditional, you know, just all that crap. And, um, and so, so, but it really does seem, I use the word blasphemous all the time. It really seems that, that we're, you know, going to get struck down with lightning that, you know, that God's not going <laughs> to like, um, you know, I, I, I don't know if, uh, um, a, a good friend of mine, he uh, uh, instituted a halftime in practice, and he said his he says coach is almost mutinied. <laughs> well, it's like we got guys sitting <clears throat> sitting and drinking under a shade tree. This isn't a football. And he goes, "Well, I think there's half times in football games. <laughs> we can yeah, kind we... of talk, talk about the first half, talk about the second <laughs> half, get our batteries going, and." and Anyway, but yeah, football is a fascinating game. <laughs> no, coach. I mean, it, it's so funny because you've almost described my arc as a coach, maybe as a person, because I'm starting to mellow out a little bit. But I was the fiery in your face. We don't walk on the paint, coach. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was that guy. And since the later half of my career, uh, you know, I, I kind of learned some of this stuff. And it's amazing because some of my kids – they were like, you know, coach, when I was a freshman, you were kind of an a-hole. And they were like, you've really loosened up and everything. And they're like, and man, I love running track for you. You're just this funny, you know, you know, lucky, you know, kind of, you just have this great attitude out at track practice and all. And then you kind of took it in spring football. We weren't sure how to react. And I was like, well, guys, I can grow too. You know, I, you know, we, we learn as we go. And so, you know, if, if you're a coach listening to this podcast, I think it's a great example of you always need to be learning and growing. And that's why we have this podcast, but th that was coach it hit me right here because it was the most true thing anyone's ever said about me without meaning to talk about me so that's why me and matt are laughing so hard because that, that is right here coach and it, it makes sense and i i love that i've changed through that um but it, it's it's dead on the mark coach 100 percent. i was that way till i was 40 <laughs> there and you go i was that, i was <clears throat> I, I don't know if there was any coach meaner than me i mean <laughs> seriously i mean i I visit Bobby Knight's praxis, you know, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know why that turned me mean, but, um, but no, it, um, I, I got to the point where, you know, I would say things like this isn't meant to be fun. Yeah. We're here to win. And we're I've not done it when I'm, when I'm talking about fun and practice, I'm not talking about like birthday party fun. Yeah. I'm talking about competing like crazy fun or making a violent hit fun oh yeah and 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 really really competing i i think that that good athletes have fun when they compete oh they, yeah they don't, they don't have fun when they're loosey-goosey <laughs> talking trash and so it's just really reframing what we're trying to do yeah um so random question i'm going to throw in here we've talked about the intrinsic rewards and everything and I'm trying to word this carefully because I'm just trying to think of, of how it would fit in. But, you know, every once in a while, a kid screws up in the classroom or he mouths off to a teacher. And, you know, we stopped calling it punishment. We called it um, opportunities for improvement. Do you have any that we can do while still being feed the cats ish? Right. It used to be that you, you did. You made them run laps. You made them like 
duck walk a hundred yards or something like that. So is there still something good there that you can give them an opportunity for improvement where it still changes their mindset, but it's feed the cats ish. Yeah, or you could have them run laps carrying a tackling dummy. <laughs> yeah. or, are you, are or, you asking if he knows any fun punishments? Yeah, well, I, I'm not, <laughs> correct, right? I'm trying to say, like, look, if, if we're really taking on this feed the cats mentality, we can't just tell a kid because you're in trouble, you go run 10 laps, and we completely collapse everything we've been teaching. So what are those those ways of doing, you know, sometimes you do have to punish a kid, and I'm not trying to say it like, it's something any of us love, but sometimes you have to, have to do it. So what's the answer to that when you're doing Feed the Cats? I really appreciate that question because it's something I talk about a lot. And football mm. coaches really have this idea that if, if you cannot physically punish a kid, you can't punish them. And, and I always first say that my mother never physically punished me. But because I respected her, she could give me a look <laughs> that would hurt me deeply. Yeah. You, you understand what I'm saying? Oh, so yeah. The first thing you do is, is you develop respect of your players uh, where they love you, respect you. They hang on every word. And if you have that, you often do not have to go to physical punishment. The second thing, and I do this a lot. Um, I did this as a football coach. There, there are certain things that I just did not accept, like jumping off sides. I did <laughs> not accept jumping off. Sides. Uh, uh, you know, a, a screw up offensively with guy not thinking. I did not accept that. And so that guy comes out, and I was probably not nice to him. Yeah. I mean, I, it's probably more than a look. And and that guy probably felt about one inch tall. And one or two plays later. I go, you going to make that mistake anymore? He goes, no, sir. Bam. You go <laughs> right back in. Yeah. My point being this, that I didn't have, I didn't make him run a lap or do push-ups or, or yeah. I mean, Mike Leach used to have, have guys carry a cinder block around with them around campus. You know, he also put that guy in a shed <laughs> too, you know, and he got in trouble. <laughs> with that. Um, yeah. Can't do that. <laughs> No, that'll that'll get you fired at Texas Tech even. Um, uh, So anyway, I think that that if you have a good culture, that that your kids want to please you, just like I want to please my parents, my coaches, all that stuff. (laughs) And so you let them know when you're not pleased. And then secondly, you take stuff away from them. It may be a play or two. It might be having them stand on the sideline the entire practice. Uh, once in a while, even, <laughs> even with good coaches, uh, you'll have a kid roll his eyes when you tell him something. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. You know, I, I'm a nice guy. I feed the cats, but that's, I don't, nobody's no. going to roll their eyes. And that guy, I, I will have to talk to myself so I don't <laughs> overdo the kicked out of practice thing. But what I want to do is say, I want you to go home. And come back tomorrow and never do that again. I don't know if you've ever been kicked out of a practice, but the walk of shame. Yep. uh, I've never been kicked out of a practice, but I I can only imagine the walk of shame leaving your teammates. And I just don't think that ever happens again. And, you know, there's nothing that is a better punishment than taking away the incredible opportunity to play a great game 100 percent. that's what i think you know coach holler not only have i been kicked out of practice as a player one time coach dixon tried to kick me out of practice as a coach uh this is a story we won't get into but super funny he tried to send me off one day when i was his dc or uh, whatever i was or defensive assistant or something like that um i refused him quietly apologized and went back to my job, but, uh, I have been trying to he, he try to kick me out one time. <laughs> yeah. That's why you're Say such that. great friends today. We are, yeah. we are. And, uh, we have a lot of good stories like that, but we've probably had as good arguments as, as anyone. Um, so getting back to the point here, back to feed the cats, I, you know, I know you're, you're a track guy. Um, but I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about applications of feed the cats in the weight room. Um, when, when I'm asked about the weight room, people are very dissatisfied with my answers. Okay. Uh, I think strength is good. 
I think the weight room is overrated. Uh, once you know, like every football coach has just turned off this podcast. Um, you know, we have, we have a big sign in our weight room that champions are born in the weight room. I disagree. <laughs> I, I think champions are born first of all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're, they're being big and fast and athletic, and and then playing in a good football program or something—that's that's how champions are born. But the weight room is important. What I say is is there's nothing in the weight room that directly improves speed. I cannot watch anybody in the weight room do any lift and say that guy's fast because he can do that lift really well. Because, you know, people say, oh, cleans. I've seen slow guys that could do cleans. You know, you, you don't have to be fast to do a clean. Um, well, the cleans are good. Yeah, sure, they're good. That's fine. So I say stay general in the weight room. Get strong. And when I say general, you push and pull and squat and hinge, you know, and and you you try to get a stimulus of 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 weightlifting and not a crushing blow of weightlifting. You know, we grew up with no pain, no gain, because that's yeah. what Arnold Schwarzenegger did. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's that's how you get big is no pain, no gain in steroids. Um, that that's how you get big. Uh, that's, I mean, that's the exact, and eat a lot, and eat a lot. So I say stay general in the weight room, be specific in practice, and then extreme in speed training. The other thing I say is the weight room should never interfere with the sport. It really bothers me that a lot of football coaches lift their kids really heavy throughout the track season, and they don't care if there's a meet. They don't care if there's an important workout. I think that's wrong. For any of my track guys to come out and say, Coach, I'm going to be slow today. I, uh, you know, Coach so and so made me, you know, squat, you know, 10 sets, of blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that's just awful. It, it, same way, we, we would never crush our kids on a game day in football. Yeah. Ever. I don't think we should ever crush our kids in the weight room. And then the other thing is never let strength training interfere with speed. Now, the only way you'll know that's happening is if you time if if, if you're not timing if you're just running you'll never know if what you're doing in the weight room might be interfering with your team speed so talk about how with that timing you know that something's off what are those key indicators that you're like i got to figure out either the kid's not eating or his girlfriend broke up with them or he's getting crushed in the in the weight room what are those indicators that you see well it, it it's pretty simple you know like if you have a guy you know i'm big on miles per hour um you know on my track team we are our first day of practice today we had eight guys over 22 miles an hour and that's a really fast first day team and uh um if if we practice all week next week and and our guys, those guys running 22 or running 21 or 19 or, you know, it's, it's probably me that needs to look in the mirror. I need, okay, what have we done? Now, if it's one kid that's really slow, then we talk. You know, like, what's up, man? I mean, you're not help. Speed is the best barometer of health there is. You can ask a kid. Are, do you feel good? Are you healthy? They'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not a good barometer. <laughs> speed speed is. So if, if I have one of those eight fast kids that are two miles an hour slow, it's probably not me. It's probably him. And the first thing we talk about speed, not speed. First thing we talk about is sleep. Um, I believe in championship sleep. We say, people say the feed the cats is easy or something. You're, you're, you're soft. <laughs> well, you know, what's not easy for a teenager is to get nine hours of sleep. Yeah. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do ever, ever, ever. It's hard for me, you know, like and <clears throat> as a teenager, sleep was just something I, I wish I didn't have to do. I wish I could stay up all night every night. You know, I love the night and I still do. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, so, so that might be it. It could be like you say, when I talk about, I want my guys to be happy and healthy. Happy does not mean to giggly happy. It means mentally healthy. Yeah. That's what happy means to me. 
And as you know, there's a lot of teenagers that are not mentally healthy. They they uh, have tough home lives. You mentioned like girl problems. You know, they, girl problems are hard, hard yeah. for the teenager. They're not equipped for that. Hell, we're not equipped for that. You know, like relationships are, are yeah, you could really have a bad day. <laughs> yeah. and, and so you just have that talk with them. And you know what happens when you have that talk? That kid knows that you care. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, everybody talks about culture, culture. Culture is mainly that kids care about the sport and they understand the high expectations and uh, they want to please you. There, There's nothing as a parent, there's nothing more important than having kids that, that don't want to disappoint you. Yeah. That, that want to please you. And I, I just see the same thing as a chemistry teacher. I see the same thing as a track coach, a football coach, a basketball coach, that if, if your players are busting their ass and they care about how you think about them, yeah, probably going to be a pretty good team. Oh yeah. <laughs> we see it all the time. Um, so real quick, I, I actually pulled this up while we were talking. I actually have one of our sheets where we did student athlete performance. Um, I'm going to share it with you real quick. I'm, I'm just curious to get your take on it. Um, if I can actually pull it up correctly. So we built these right here. I did it with the help of coach Aaron Avery, uh, to give him a shout out, but here's an example. This, this kid was a, a big D tackle for us. He also played baseball at the time and we kind of track some things here and it's, it's not a whole season's worth of data. It's, it's about three or four months, but it's amazing when we just got him sprinting, how much faster he got. Cause he had never had sprint training in his entire life. I mean, the, the jump was two miles per hour and you can, can see that consistent curve going up. It's pretty wild. So did he become a better player because of that. <laughs> yes, he was way better. He's actually an O-lineman now and, and he's pretty darn good. Uh, he was probably always an O-lineman, but he played D-tackle for us when he was a freshman. And he's a he's a big kid. I mean, he's one of those 330-pound kids, and, and he could move pretty well by the end of it. So now, he was a <clears> – Yeah, like if, if he's a 300-pound kid, <laughs> as you know, yeah, that can sprint, he's a D1 tackle. Yeah. It's about oh, me, yeah. Especially if he's tall enough. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's yeah. really – it's He's really, not, but yes, <laughs> it's really important to have long arms as an yeah, offense. So it, it's kind of funny. So, uh, coach Avery ch did that. And at the top where the name was, and I'll get Akeem's permission before he post that, but at the top where his name is, you can actually pull it down and click any kid and it pops up. Uh, cause we had some pretty special kids in track that you're at a freshman girl that actually hit 20 miles per hour as a freshman girl. Um, That's she's, usually, she's you know, unreal. Miles per hour girls are typically three miles an hour behind boys. So I say, give me, give me eight kids that run 23 miles an hour yep. and we will win the state championship. And, um, <clears throat> with just my sprinters, not even yep. counting my field events or anything. I mean, if I have that kind of athleticism, we're going to be a state champion. Well, uh, <clears throat> the equivalent for girls is 20. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> any girl that runs 20 should be on the award stand at the state meet, you know, at the end of the season. Yep. She was close. Uh, she was a freshman. So mentally kind of at the end of the year, she got a little jitters. Um, but I had three girls that ran 20. Um, I took nine girls to the state championship that year. I say I, like I did anything. All I did was implement this, um, took nine girls. Two of them were jumpers. One was a thrower. And then the rest were sprinters. Uh, we had no distance girls on the team. We had one. And, uh, but it was amazing how it, such an enjoyable thing, but those girls were so good. And again, we ran on this concrete track. I mean, it was the worst conditions we could do it. So feed the cats became even more important because we had the worst surface ever to run on. Yeah. So such a good thing. Well, coach, every podcast we end with this. Now <laughs> we always ask this question. Most of everything you said has been pretty unique, but I want you to kind of think back recently on your years and, and what's the most unique thing or what's the coolest thing you guys do that no one else does outside of feed the cats, maybe there's a drill in there or something else that you do that's super unique to, to you. The most unique mm -hmm. thing we do. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's almost like everything we do. Is, Correct. It's that's... like, it's <laughs> like, okay, okay. Here, here's one. I actually told my team this tonight. Um, th th this kind of goes uh, as counterintuitive as anything we'll ever do. Um, I told my team on the first hmm. night of track practice, I said, every team in America will outwork us. But we're going to beat 99% of them. 
And they're like looking that. at each other and, and like, <laughs> Coach, you think that's a good idea? I mean, because they've they've grown up in the same world that we grew up in. You know, like when you lose, what do you have to do the next week? Work, Work twice hard. as hard. Yeah, and that's how losing yeah. streaks get started. By the way, <laughs> is, is, is piling on and pile, you know, like <laughs> you, you lose three in a row, and by that time you're practicing eight hours a day. You know, that's not good. <laughs> and they grew up all oh, the mythological guys like Kobe Bryant that said he'd get up every morning at four and practice for two hours eat breakfast, go practice another two, eat lunch, go practice <laughs> another two. That's total mythology, total. Every great athlete wants to tell you they got there because they work 10 times harder than people like we, like us. Yeah. And that, because that that's the mythology they want to latch on to. And it might have been that, you know, Kobe Bryant had really good parents, you know, that maybe played in the NBA and, you know, like he did. And, you know, he, he was born tall and he was smart and he had good coaches and he was able to afford nutritionists and trainers. And I'm sure he worked. I'm not saying he doesn't work, but I'm saying that there, for every guy that claims they work eight hours a day, there are 10 others that got broken because yeah. they got, listened to that guy. So, so getting back to what I told my team, we are going to have an hour practice and you guys are going to do less than 70 seconds of work. Yeah. So what does that mean about those 70 seconds? Better and be they, really important. <laughs> kind of like performance level, right? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if we're doing a five second thing and you give me three, you know, that's probably not going to work. No. You know, <laughs> you, let, let's, 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 you know, I say that we do everything like at an 11 on a scale of 10. And, and that's kind of the secret sauce. But I don't think, I don't think many coaches on the first day ever claim that every school in America is going to outwork. So. <laughs> no, coach, I, I've never heard that one. But I, I think then again, that's, that's what makes you and what you guys do unique. Matt, do you have any other closing questions before we do our little closing statements here? Coach, I just got one thing that kind of stuck to my guts here. Uh, you said that coaches disregard the health of athletes um, when they're training the way they do typically. And, um, man, that I mean, that makes me uncomfortable to think about because I know it's true. And I wow. know we've done that in the past. And and that really, like, I wrote it down as soon as you said it because it, it's it's just speaking truth to me that a lot of coaches do disregard the health of their athletes in the name of winning, in the name of conditioning. And um, I think you're showing a better way. That's that, that's really a meaningful thing uh, to me because I think that's why, you know, I'm not a religious guy, but people say I present like I'm like an evangelical preacher at a tent revival or something. <laughs> and and I, I think I got some of that in me, but it comes from the heart because I think I was broken as an athlete. I think I was broken. And one of those coaches was my dad, who we literally had his funeral today. You know, so it, 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 it's a, um, I love my dad, but he was old school. He evolved and got better and better as he grew older, but he was old school and all my coaches were old school and, and I was broken um, mentally and physically. And then I have my own kids. I have three but four kids and three of my boys, two of them are coaches now. And, and, but they all had the joy of sport stolen from them by abusive coaches. And you know what? Some of those abuses, abusive coaches are still loved by their players. Yeah. I call it the Stockholm syndrome where the captive starts to love, you know, the, his, the guy who captured him. Yeah. You know, they, <laughs> the, the hostages start, you know, liking the guy that, you know, put them in a cage. Um, and there's something about, we want to like our coaches. Yeah. But, but no, we, we need to, and once again, and when you care about the health, the speed, the athleticism, the mental health of your athletes, you are telling them that you love them. And anybody that thinks that's soft does not understand love because things that we love, we will suffer for. Yeah, we, absolutely. You know, like, 
like if you love your your kids you will and you will suffer for kids <laughs> and, i have a two-year-old <laughs> boy do i know that one they're, they're suffering that, that you are going through but you love them and that, and that allows you to suffer and so if we can get kids to love the sport not just the games but the whole sport um and and we love them and they love us uh, i i think we're willing to <laughs> suffer together yeah and there's going to be losses there's going to be injuries, you know, things like that. But I think people who love what they're doing will fight through those things. Absolutely. So Matt, uh, you know, Coach Holler, I didn't tell you this, but before we came into this, I was a, a big time believer in Feed the Cats. Matt was skeptical. Uh -oh. So Matt, I'm just, I just want to hear now, are you a little <laughs> less skeptical? Or are you buying in? What's going on? You can tell the truth. Coach won't care. I, I'm a lot less skeptical. Uh, hearing you talk about how, it affects offensive linemen. I, I find that to be completely true. You know, your best your best athletes are your best athletes. Um, I, I, I've always been in the mindset of here in Florida, we got to be ready to go. It's going to be hot. It's going to be – we know what those September Friday nights bring. And I always wanted to be the team that was in better shape. I didn't want to leave a game out on the field um, for being in worse shape week one. But the way you present it, how many kids did I run off in the process of that were that would have brought us wins? You know, so I think there there is something to be said for that. And uh I'm definitely gonna be looking more into uh into your program, coach. Cool. Well, you know, I, and, uh, you, you're my favorite kind of guy because you know I <laughs> Being the evangelical uh, uh, preacher that I am, you know, I'm, I'm trying to convert people, you know, constantly. So if we if we need to have a couple of zooms in the next couple, you know, like next couple of weeks, you know, to further, you know, uh, get your conversion going. Uh, no, it, it, I think you're, I'm there. You're you're, you're, lean, you're leaning into it. All your linemen are going to be one mile an hour faster. You're going to get a couple of linemen that come out that you didn't expect to come out. You know that uh, there's always like on a basketball team, some six four kid that weighs two fifteen. You know, yep. Thinks going to be in the <laughs> NBA. Probably, Never is. probably needs to be playing football, right? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a it, it's so true. And Matt, such a funny thing. Now I, I hope to see you run around screen feed the cats like I do, like an uh -huh. idiot all the time. <laughs> I love it. I would run around school just saying it. People are like we're going to feed them cats today, and like. Regular students would look at me and they're like, what are you doing? I don't even know what that means. I don't run track. I'm like, feed the cats. Now, you realize so. that most football <laughs> coaches uh, do not say it's feed the cats. Most football coaches, <laughs> uh, what they like to say is sprint-based football. Yeah. Which, I'm sticking with feed the cats. I like it. That's, that's fine. I, I make no money on people saying <laughs> feed the cats or anything like that. But <laughs> um, but the, what, what I make is the fact that you're making kids' lives better. Yeah. That, that's good. Yeah. And that's the goal. And so if you're more interested in some of the Feed the Cat stuff, um, Coach, you have a video series on CoachTube, correct? Yes. I actually uh, have a bundle, a Feed the Cats uh, football bundle that has all my speed training, all that kind of stuff with the football stuff, with stuff from Brad Dixon, which Brad Dixon and Garrett <laughs> Mueller are absolutely the two guys, both state champs this year, both 14-0, yep. both sprint-based football, one for – three years now and one for five and uh, and those guys are really good but anyway i have a lot of that stuff and i think the bundle is only 97 bucks so um uh, it's that's way good. cheaper than when i bought it so there you go go buy it now um i'm a guy I, i'm i'm a customer so if, if you're interested in the sprint based stuff uh, we will put it in the description here in youtube uh if you're listening on apple or spotify you can just go to our youtube page and see that um, again, if you're interested in having any questions for Coach, he's on Twitter. It's at PN Track. Um, also, you can email us questions. I'll make sure to get it to Coach. You can email us at the Board Drill Podcast at gmail.com. You can DM us on Twitter at Board Drill Pod. And again, we're on all these different mediums. We're on Spotify, we're on Apple, we're on YouTube. So tune in, let us know what you think. We'd love to hear your ideas on sprint based football or feed the cats, however you want to talk about it. And uh, let's get a conversation going, coaches, because we're here for education. So if you got any questions, even if you're skeptical, drop them to us. We'll answer them to the best of our ability or we'll get them over to Coach. Coach Holler, thanks for giving us your time tonight. We appreciate you coming on the Board Drill Podcast. I loved it. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Coach. Thank you so much, Coach.